Ready to go in in just a beat. Okay, right on. Here we go. Okay, welcome everybody. It is December 2022 and our last monthly soft bulk for a little while. Who knows what the future holds, but we'll definitely be getting the whole gang back together from time to time. We're thinking more quarterly or seasonal working into 2023. But that means today is extra special. We're so excited to have Ai Kojima with us, who gets to introduce, well, I'll introduce ourselves in just a minute. But let's start with a conversational question. If you'll find the chat button at the bottom of your screen, the question for you today, which is going to get you thinking about what many of us are talking about, uh, what did your sheets look like when you were a child? Can you remember your childhood bed sheets? And I know I can, and I didn't even think I knew this until I saw them again as an adult. Megan King, and I don't know if Megan's here, but one day Megan King was working with some fabric that was orange, mustard, and white stripes. Ooh. And I saw those sheets and I was like, that's what I had on my bed when I was in elementary school. It just took me back. I didn't even know I remembered that. Right. So thank you, Megan, for showing me that and sending me a scrap after we made that connection. Those are my bed sheets. Heidi, what about you? I had some Laura Ashley rosette flannel sheets that I remember especially vividly. <laughs> when I had town puppies. Oh, really? Those are the ones I remember. I mean, obviously, they weren't a single set of sheets for my entire childhood, but town puppies, I don't, you know. That's <laughs> <laughs> I, what were your childhood sheets? <laughs> it's kind of boring, but I had like a plain solid green marimekko. Ooh, oh, cool. but Mari Mako, that's a classic <laughs> choice. <laughs> it looks like we have in the chat some very classic Little Mermaid, mm. um, some scratchy sheets, Sesame Street, Holly Hobby, stiff white sheets from the drying line. I'm wondering if Claudia and I, I think I also had those sheets, Claudia. I would love to compare pictures sometime. About that primary color jungle scene that seems to be a, one that was popular especially in the 80s oh um vicky had strawberry shortcake which was also popular in the 80s and i've got a a, a bed sheet twin chrissy had laura ashley lilacs and i love what becky said is that you can pretty much guess people's age by asking about what sheets they grew up with because yeah. <laughs> kids especially tend to get Mm, pop culture sheets a lot of time, right? Or something that's relevant to the time. And so, yeah, it does, it does tie, doesn't it? All right, well, y'all keep those answers coming. Keep sharing about your bed sheets because that is going to set us up real nice for the conversation that we're going to be having today. Before we get officially started, we're going to do a quick round of introductions and then we'll jump in unless y'all have some questions. If you don't know me, I'm Zach Foster. I do a lot of stuff. I used to always say that I make repurposed quilts from repurposed materials. And I think that's still true, but also... I'm sitting here darning today and mending, so I'm doing that as well. I'm going to share with you a couple of projects that I made inspired by our conversation last month, so that'll be interesting. Heidi? I'm Heidi Parks. I'm in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I do a lot of hand piecing and hand quilting, and there's a lot of diary in my quilts, a lot of memoir storytelling, and um, today, me and Zach, both of us, in exactly two hours, we'll be seeing our moms. So I'm very excited that my mom is up from Florida for the holidays. Luke. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Luke Haynes, uh, recovering architect, quilt maker, <laughs> bed breaker, bread baker, bread baker, uh, et cetera. Um, kind of like Zach, you know, the whatever we say is our tagline is always just the tip of the iceberg. It's just, you know, <laughs> who knows what. Um, but I'm in sunny California, so welcome everyone. I. Uh, hello everyone. My name is Ai Kijima. Uh, I'm an artist based in Brooklyn. So happy to be here. Nice meeting you, everybody. And if you're not familiar with Ai's work, prepare to be blown out of the water. Ai, you do beautiful stuff. All right. Um, now, here I am a month to a keynote, Luke, and you think I'd have figured this out. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, tr <laughs> I'm trying to get my notes popped up. Got it. Got it. We're there ready, folks. Go. Okay, and it's going to pop up right about now. So I got some new work to share with you. Let me put, these are my old jeans that I'm mending. They are my favorite jeans, and they have dozens of men's on them. 
I'm trying to keep them wearable. So I'm going to set those to the side so I can focus on what I want to share with you. So um, got two quilts to share with you today. And the first one is a response to something that came up last month. Last month, if you remember, we were sitting around, I was sharing um, a new series I started on sex quilts. And it, it was one I felt particularly vulnerable about sharing. Um, I, I made, <laughs> made that pretty clear. <laughs> um, and in all, and in the two years that we've been doing softball, we've never once gotten a critical piece of feedback about what we shared until last month. And so I've made a piece and I want to share it with you. And it's another vulnerable piece. Uh, that said, you're always welcome to mute me until you see Heidi's face pop up and then you can unmute. But here we go. It's nothing too crazy. So you'll remember this is what I looked like last month. And I was wearing a red t-shirt, which was one of my all-time favorite t-shirts. I'm going to tell you the story about it in just a minute. But I was wearing that shirt, talking to y'all last month, talking about the sex quilts. And we get this email soon after signing off. And I'm not going to say the person's name because I haven't even looked in the list. You might be here today. And if you are, I still got a lot of love for you. Still got a lot of respect. When I first saw the email pop up in my box, I was excited because I really do have a lot of respect for this particular artist. But it went like this. Dear soft bulks. And I love the plural of that. I think that's adorable. I'm interested in so much of what you have to say. But I think I speak for many of us 70 pluses when I say that does not include so much information about your queer meetups, the tools you use for measuring your estrogen levels, or where you are located on the autism spectrum. I love you all and I'm grateful for what you're doing. Can you not keep it a little less intimate? Thank you for letting me get that off my chest. And that email, it shook me because I think it sounds very nice, doesn't it? It sounds very nice. Um, there's a lot of I love you, I'm grateful and all of this but it just shook me. And in fact, it got to a point where I was sitting there after reading it nearly in tears. And that's why I texted my friend Heidi. I said, Heidi, I got to talk to you about this. And so I sat down and I wrote this person back, but I never sent it, which is funny because I, I try to respond to everybody that writes to me. And I figured this will be my response, this quilt I'm about to show you. And so yeah, let's just, we'll just jump in. Um, there's something I think of all of this that stuck out to me. I mean, queer had, when she said queer meetups, that had a little bit of a sting to it, I'll be honest. But for me, the question was, can you not keep it a little less intimate? Um, and I think that is such a fascinating question to poke around in because I feel like that's what so many artists do. We work with the stuff of our lives and we work with intimate stuff. In fact, I think, well, at least something I'm experimenting with as an artist is trying to figure out which thoughts do I have right now in my bandwidth that are taking up a lot of my energy? What am I feed? Which thoughts am I feeding with my energy? And then how can I use those thoughts in my work? Because chances are, if the energy is already there in my thought process, it'll yield some interesting results in my creative work as well. So I'm going to say, let's keep it intimate. And so here's the quilt that I ended up making. Here we go. Here's the quilt I ended up making. It is that shirt that I was wearing last month sitting here with y'all. You can see nestled inside of that shirt, some lettering, the, the question that the person sent us, can you not be a little less intimate? This shirt was important to me. Mm. I should say I chose this because I wanted something that wasn't an easy response. It was hard for me to take one of my favorite items of clothing, decommission it as an item of clothing and put it into this response. Uh, but I felt in doing show, so showed how much this matters to me, right? This shirt was one I found when I was still living in North Carolina and Raleigh, and I would run around Lake, jo um, Lake Johnson nearly every day. And somebody had left this shirt on the side of the trail and they left it there one day. And I went back the second day because I liked it so much. And I went back the third day and it was still there. And so I figured after three days, it was up for grabs. I took it home, washed it, and it's been mine for over 15 years now. I have worn it so much that is now threadbare, which is why I was able to insert the lettering that you see underneath, right? It's nestled in between the first, the front of the shirt and the back of the shirt. You can see pit stains, because guess what? It's real life. We make stuff out of the stuff of our lives. I didn't even wash this shirt, y'all. If you just smell the pits, you'd smell me. 
It's just reality, right? I got the backing that you see when I was uh, thrifting with Amanda Nadig in Chicago. I love that pillowcase. And I was so moved by all this. That made this entire piece in two days. So as I signed it, I also put November 19th and 20th, 2022. It was a fast and furious 48 hours, right? It is sewn down on an old army wool blanket. And you can see the back there for what it's worth. So this is my response to the person's question. Can I be a little less intimate? I mean, I could, but that feels like asking somebody to go back in the closet. And that feels a little bit, that feels really uncomfortable for me. I would suggest if something is being discussed around you that you find uncomfortable, you ask, why does that make me uncomfortable? If it's untrue or if it's hurtful, then by all means, consider speaking up and saying something. But if it's making you uncomfortable for other reasons, then maybe you think about what are some other responses I could do? Like, hey, maybe I just unfollow Zach on Instagram, which is what this person did. And that feels entirely appropriate. There are, I'm going to move on to the second quote here because it segues really nicely. There are always going to be some things people don't want to talk about, right? And I have another series I'm starting on family history or what I'm calling Southern white amnesia. The stories that white families in the South do tell and don't tell one another as the generations go on. There are people in my family that would probably prefer me not to make this quilt that I'm about to share with you. I would ask them to examine the source of their discomfort because everything I'm about to tell you is true and it's not intended to be hurtful. It might be unexpected, but it's not intended to be hurtful. So I am the family historian in my family. I find this stuff fascinating. And it's a space that a lot of queer people I find operate in is the, the keepers of the stories and the keeper of the truths. Of course, not exclusively, but a lot of times. And so when I started digging up records that my ancestors enslaved people back in the day, and to date over 400 folks I found records for, when I first asked somebody in my family about that, I was like, did, I was like, did we enslave people, I ask? The answer was no. Pause. I think we would know. And to me, that was such an eye-opening response. And I'm so thankful for it because it made me wonder how many other Southern white families are operating under the same idea that, oh, if we had participated in history this way, I think we would know. But I would ask, why do you think we would know? And so this is where I started drawing on this vintage quilt that I had found online of Sunbonnet Sue and her friend Overall Sam. And Luke, I you know, tie a lot of this inspiration back to you and how you're working with quilts. I know you're gonna touch on that in a minute. But why would we know if, like Sunbonnet Sue, we got blinders on? You never see Sunbonnet Sue's face. She's not facing forward. She's not facing reality. Overall, Sam, her old pal, actually has his back towards, towards us, right? So, like, why would we know if we're not even looking? And in 2022, we can very easily look. It's called Ancestry.com, and you could know within a couple hours if you have that kind of um, connection to the historical institution of slavery. And so. For me, the significance, and, and just wrapping up with this, is I found this old house dress, this pale pink house dress uh, at a thrift shop recently. And I picked it because of the color, right? That pale pink to me spoke about white skin, whiteness, pinkness, all that. But also it's in the idea that it's a house dress. Like it is what someone puts on in order to be appropriate for company, should they drop by. It's something, a garment people put on if uh, maybe to cover up nakedness or vulnerability, right? So in thinking about the kinds of stories Southern white families often tell themselves or don't tell themselves, to me, it's much like this house dress that we use to cover up the parts of us that we would rather not have publicly acknowledged. So this is just another way in which I am working with the intimate stuff of my life to try to make something uh, relevant true and it will move the conversation forward. So I, I know that most of you appreciate it because I should say that it, we did get a lot of really positive responses from last month's episode. People that were thankful that I was talking about uh, alternative models of <laughs> fidelity and relationships, they felt seen. And that's a good thing too, right? So thank you for letting me uh, share these two pieces with you. Thank you for listening through. I haven't read the chat yet, but I'll go do that as soon as I cede the floor to Heidi. Thank you very much.
Zach, this is one of those soft books where I'm going to have to email you a copy of the chat because it is beautiful. Really, really lovely comments. You will not have time to read all of them and they all need reading. Um, uh, right, let me just, I'm, I'm going to throw in just a little comment real quick, Heidi, because I'm, you know, uh, just while we're, while we're in this sort of brain space, and that is just to say, um, I think it's so interesting that the email came from someone who had information from at least three different media sources. Um, the reference to my work, I only mentioned on Instagram. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the piece about me means that they were following me in a different way. So it's just interesting to kind of think about how we're all tied together and, you know, what that intimacy means. Cause that's generally the reason somebody wants to follow, you know, you could, look, if you want to see pictures of quilts, you could do it. Um, and it, you know, the three, the, the four of us aren't the only quilt makers. We're not the most, um, accessible in terms of just simple patterning, but people follow us for that reason, I think. And so it's just interesting that that intimacy was the, was then the reason that it was kind of turned on its head. So I don't, I, you know, I don't know where that falls, but, but just that um, intimacy is what makes us different and what makes, mm -hmm. uh, the, what, what makes it a conversation is, you know, it's not just uh, reproducing, it is a conversation, which is going to be sort of what I talk about. So I just wanted to, to throw that in there. Yeah, thank you, Luke. Um, you know, and I think that 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 kind of intimacy that we all share and bring is a really exciting, inspiring thing. There are a lot of people like Amanda, who was on last week, who were inspired to be more serious about quilting because of what we've shared more intimately and some of the backdrop of how it works to be a quilter and how you might become part of the quilt world or exhibit your work. And all of those little kind of inside background things are incredibly helpful and um, important to share. I think, um, you know, and just, you know, I, I dig for everyone and, um, the, those quilts that she referenced of mine are ones that got me to be a finalist in the Knoll Fellowship here in Milwaukee twi two years in a row and was in QuiltCon at the, the end of a row this last year. And that's, that's work that I'm really proud to have made and conversations that I think we all three feel really proud to have begun and shared. So, um, on, onward there, speaking of, um, sharing things intimately, I am going to give a little bit of a tour of my website today. So I'm going to share my screen for you. And I was inspired to do this part for a few reasons. Um, partly because I know I, because we went to college at the same time, on one occasion, I was in her studio. I don't think I was even there, but I was an undergrad and you were a graduate student and I got to see your space and was just in awe that a quilt could look like that. I had been recently very inspired by the Quilts of Cheese Bend, and this was just such an eye-opening new idea for how a quilt could be. So I, I loved that right away. And then I went on to be a high school art teacher for nearly a decade. And when I changed careers, I went back to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and got a lot of alumni support. It's something they offer for free for all of their students. And it's, it's really incredible. And they helped me figure out how to do a website. And I came in with this very small idea that like a quilter was a thing I could be. And in one of my many, many one-on-one -on -one meetings that I had, I, I came to one of the advisors and I said, you know, I've seen these websites for counterpain and folk fibers and Luke Haynes, and I think they're quilters and I think I could be too. And this man took me, who I can't remember his name right now, but he took me through those three websites and said, hey, this is what they're doing. And it taught me how to look at a website in a completely new way. So that's um, a skill that I'm hoping to unpack for everyone is how do you look at or read or engage with a website in a way that's completely different, at least from how I used to before I got that introduction. And just a little window as well into that um, support that I got in college. So this is the splash page, HeidiParks.com. You can see my Instagram, which is a very important tool for me and a spot to join my mailing list, which I 
resisted making one for a long, long time. But now uh, that was one of my New Year's resolutions. Um, how long ago was that? I don't know, four years ago was my New Year's resolution to finally get on the newsletter boat. And it has been really, really helpful for me. Definitely a game changer in my career. So the mailing letter newsletter is on the first page. And then if you click over to about, that's a place where you can have a lot of deep, interesting information. So here I've got, you can see I have a YouTube channel. I've got a three minute video about me where you can understand a little more about who I am. I've got my artist statement, which uh, this is still one that was, I got a lot of help at the Art Institute in writing this statement. Uh, it's one that I referenced recently where I refer to some of the artists who inspire me and those, um, yeah, I'll, I'll have to see if maybe I can update with a hybrid of some of the other statements that I use, but got a picture statement. And then you can see, recent exhibitions. So right now I have a quilt at the Gallery 224. Um, I need to update it, but I currently also have a quilt at the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Art. And you can see some of these past exhibitions. And that was huge when I was looking at Luke's website years and years ago in 2014. <laughs> Um, because we went and found your resume and saw some of the early places where your career got started and where you were first exhibiting. And it was an idea, a window to me of, oh, this is the kind of place that I could start if I want to be like someone who's 10 years ahead of me in their career. So I linked to a lot of public speaking and certainly listening to um, things like softball or podcast episodes gives a window into the mind of an artist and how that type of thing works. I've got some magazine articles and other creative links, spaces where I'm on someone else's website. And then here you can see my resume. And so that is something that pops up and you can see, of course, where I went to school, some different awards. You can understand a little bit about how I've chosen to format it. There are lots of different options for formatting, as well as you can get ideas about, oh, back in 2015, what was Heidi doing when she first started out? Like, oh, um, you know, have company now Marley Grace it was a really exciting um, thing for me to be involved in at that time. And, and then the blog, but you can see that there's a blog up here too. So we'll just go with that one. Uh, the gallery is the reason why I used this square, Squarespace website is I, I wanted to be able to scroll through my quilts chronologically and then click on one and find out the information as well as see more photos. And so at a certain point, I even shared shared with Luke which template I was using um, because he liked that template that I had. So I do not remember offhand the name of the template, but I loved that I had that capability for chronological engagement on here. And you can go all the way back again and figure out, okay, this, this is the quilt Heidi made at the Art Institute back in 2003 or so in my metalworking class. And um, you know, give, gives you a sense of how my work has changed over time. I have a page about mending and my, uh, you know, commission requirement. I cannot spend time on emailing back and forth for a $40 mend anymore. So these are the details about mending and lots of beautiful photos of mends that I do, including three quilts that I quilted and mended as a commission. There's my shop, and this, of course, is a place that I link to very often where folks can purchase things. And not only can you see all the items, but you can go in and see specifically large quilts that are available or specifically ways to learn. And a lot of those classes are either lectures or on demand, which you can see with more specificity on here, as well as 
my zines, which were one of the first things that I ever had in the shopping cart of my website. And Luke has, or sorry, Zach has a lot of zines for sale on his website now, partly because I inspired him with those because he was looking close at my website strategy. Workshops are something that I have listed as well as um, past workshops, things that have happened that are in the past. And this is a great space if you're thinking, I would like to start teaching quilting classes. You can see where are the places that Heidi teaches. Oh, perhaps I want to be on my radar with them. Places like Madeline Island School of the Arts, I was well aware of them before they reached out to me. And I made sure that I was following their Instagram and getting their emails. And um, making some of those proactive connections so that I might pop up on their radar. Um, so looking at spaces like this are great ways to also figure out even now, what are the going rates for things? I was sharing that in 2015, I connected a lot with Marley. And when I was pricing this diary quilting class, I looked at the prices that Marley uses for a four week class. And I thought, that sounds like a, a price structure that makes sense. I'm going to go with that. So I was able to look through other people's uh, shops and workshops areas to think about pricing. I noticed as well that Sherry Linwood on her website has a guild page. And I thought that was a genius way to cut down on emails and just be transparent. Um, just yesterday, I got a text message from someone wondering, you know, what are your rates and how do you manage that? And this is a conversation that I asked Luke years ago, what do you charge? And Zach asked me years ago, what do you charge? And it's a great way for everyone to be on the same page in the industry. And it's a nice way to make it really quick and easy for people to find out how to work with me. I have on here linked a guild shop where you can go through and actually buy classes, on-demand classes from me for about 50% off for your guild. So for example, the whole guild could all, everyone, all 100 or 200 or however many of them there are, if you're a guild member, you could access my scrap quilting workshop. And the price gets smaller and smaller the bigger your guild is. And then I have a blog, which I add to on rare occasions, so we won't spend too much time there. But finally, there's the contact page. And I describe two different ways to contact me so that you can get help kind of quick from my assistant or get big details from me. And again, another reminder about the mailing list. So I hope that that's a helpful view. I could spend a whole hour going into details of the website and how and why they are, but um, you know, th th there's a lot that you can learn by examining more closely a website to figure out what someone's doing. And I know Heidi, just because I just last week <laughs> revamped my entire website. So it's very fresh in the memory and switched from, I don't know what the old template was, but now I'm on flat iron. So if anybody's looking at my website, zachfoster.com, and you like the layout, it's flat iron. But that's the thing about sites is they, they grow and they grow and they grow and they grow. They're such a beast. And sometimes you just got to start over. Have you done that? I have never redone my template. I had one of my students who I had taught high school to, she was a student at the Art Institute in the visual communication section. And she sat down with me for a couple of hours and helped me set up the raw data. And I was like, good, good to go on the template arena. And I, I see that Milda has asked. So I will put that in the details on the uh, YouTube channel, YouTube uh, caption. I will look it up and figure it out. Um, Becky, I'm glad you like it. The website. Thank you. All right, Luke, over to you. Awesome. Uh, thanks for showing us that good, good bit of information for people who are wanting to put their information on the, into the world and have that information accessible or, uh, for other folks to learn how to do that research. So thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to jump straight into my share screen here because we want to get to I real quick. All right, so 
um, the, 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 the sort of through line um, mostly today that I thought was, was an interesting conversation. And I'm, I'm gonna go through some quilts and some projects, but more than anything, I'm just wanting to throw an idea out for folks to think about um, and not necessarily sort of tell you how it's done as much as tell you ways I've thought about it. Um, and then we'll see ways I have thought about it. We certainly see ways Zach thinks about it all the time. But um, first slide, making sentences with other people's words, right? I was trying to kind of go for a metaphor, right? The In terms of using existing fabric or art or techniques, um, that's the language. And then we're able to use that language to create conversations, right? And, you know, obviously that makes a lot of sense from a from a writing standpoint, but it's true in the art world as well. Like we're not, we're not learning how to make a color to put on the wall of a cave uh, from scratch. We've got innovations for thousands of years that allow us to make the work that we do. And it's important to recognize that it came from somewhere. And it's important to say, gosh, I'm glad someone else did that work. I don't have to. <laughs> um, this, I, this is a book called Steal Like an Artist. And it's uh, just a little tiny book. I mean, you've sold millions and millions of copies of it. And it's well worth getting. It's well worth getting for any artist you know as a little gift. Uh, basically, it just says um, what I just said. Learn from what came before you and um, work with integrity and intention. And uh, it's okay to use the techniques and skills and um, innovations from other makers that you respect and appreciate and, and really like their work, uh, not necessarily copying outright, that becomes a bit problematic, but if you're able to um, interpret the methodology into your own work, there it, it can vastly improve how you understand what you're trying to make, because there's no way, there's no reason to re reinvent the wheel, as the saying goes. So I put a couple of pieces of just two other artists up. Um, because they're just part of our kind of art zeitgeist right now. Um, Andy Warhol, right? Andy Warhol didn't work for Campbell's. He didn't invent. He didn't invent soup. He didn't invent cans, and he didn't invent the color red, right? But these soup cans, well, they're art. We think it's art. Everyone says art, art, art. We're we're, we're all agreed on it, you know. Personal opinions aside, um, gosh, it's art. But what? what is the art here, right? And so like, that's something that we don't bring back to quilting. The cycle of art conversation doesn't come all the way back into crafts as much, right? Like we have this sense that you have to start from as far scratch as people's rules go, and then it's your work. Well, Andy Warhol silk screened some. He didn't, he didn't weave the silk to make the screen out of. He probably didn't make the frame. I can't promise that, but uh, certainly later in his career, he sure as um, all get out did not. And again, he doesn't, he didn't create soup. So what does that mean from a, an appropriation standpoint? Um, we like this work. He didn't make soup. Where Where is his ownership there? And I think it's just an important conversation to give us, I mean, and again, my point here is to give everyone a bit of freedom to play, to practice, to try, to experiment without feeling like you have to uh, exist in a bubble, right? I mean, I did not invent the log cabin pattern. Uh, I certainly did not invent the double wedding ring pattern. There's, there's quilters who use these patterns in really wonderful ways. Um, but guess what? They didn't have to start from scratch. They were able to take precedence and use it and make some really interesting stuff and do better versions of it because they didn't have to start from zero. These are a couple of pictures of an artist whose work I think about a lot and um, <laughs> liking it or not liking it does not always come into um, the conversation about thinking about it. Jeff Koons, he did this series of work where he had master paintings repainted. He hired a team of painters to redo these paintings by famous painters as precisely and closely and intentionally as possible. So this first one right there, obviously, you know, Mona Lisa, we all know about that. This one right here is a Picasso. Um, you know, here is uh, Van Gogh. Like the intention was to recreate the painting in its exact original 
as close to a perfect copy as possible. And then he hung this little blue ball, well, big blue ball, I guess, in front of it. And um, that was his contribution. So his conversation is he, he didn't make the painting. He didn't design the painting. Uh, he did, <coughs> he had everything manufactured. He didn't touch any part of it ever. And he never does. Um, and he just added this blue reflecting ball in front of it. And so now he's calling it his art. It's his work because there's a, a you know, reflection ball in front of it. And like, whether you hate that or not, it is a conversation, right? Like he didn't make this painting. He hired someone to repaint a famous painting and then hung a blue reflecting sphere in front of it that he also didn't make and now sells it for millions of dollars and you know, whatever that means. But uh, you know, cost of something does not always reflect its value. But I will say that the conversation here I think is very fascinating. I think I've got one more, no. Um, just the idea that um, his art in this case is literally not his art. Now, what does that, what does that mean? Like this is, this is uh, an example of when it's boiled down really, really, really far and it's skirting that edge of direct copying because it is direct copying, but he's added something. Uh, and so, you know, where does that sit? What does that mean? What does that, uh, what does that conversation get to? I mean, in terms of the craft world, um, it comes up, it comes up a lot. Uh, you know, I've been, <laughs> anyway, it comes up a lot. You know, you think about like pottery or, or some, you know, sort of adjacent craft medium and people are sort of like, oh, well, that's, that's my handle style. And you're like, well, you know, yes, but you know, like, is it like, obviously you didn't physically touch the handle. I made it. It looks like, you you know, whatever. And, and that is not to say that copying directly is great. I have, <laughs> I don't love it when work that looks so close to mine gets more famous than mine or goes into more museums than mine, golly darn it. Um, I do like it when those artists say that they were inspired by me, it makes me feel good. But um, anyway, my point is just to kind of find that edge of understanding where you can learn from precedent work and what it means and what you can do with it and, and kind of how to go from there. This is a, a quilt that I made referencing some Jeff Koons. Um, this is a piece of fabric I had made. I put on top of a quilt that I had found it's a quilt that's, you know, 100 plus years old. I didn't make the quilt. I didn't make the fabric. I did quilt it heavily and put it together, but kind of taking some of those pieces from that Jeff Koons conversation about sort of having it manufactured and is it mine? Um, is it my art? Uh, I didn't, I, you know, the picture of the balloon is not a balloon animal that I made or had made or any of that. It's literally someone else's across the board, but I assembled this, right? Is this mine? What is that? Um, in this case, I feel a good lot of ownership about it because it's, something I've never seen before, but again, you know, where are those edges? And it's important to think about both um, on the good side and the bad side critically. These are uh, some quilts that I found an existing quilt, the background there. And then I made a quilt that fit its exact specifications out of just some indigo dyed sheets. And then I cut this shape out and transpose between the two of them. So you can see the wiggle here is from this quilt and the wiggle here is from this quilt. So the quilts themselves have a conversation with each other um, and it becomes a, a, a dynamic dialogue between this old quilt and the one that I made. And you know, is it, is it my quilt? Is this one mine? Like I didn't make the background uh, at all. All I did was cut a hole in it. Is it mine now? Can I sell it? Who owns it? What's its value? Uh, was this one the same? I mean, there's less of the old quilt in it. There's more of my quilt, but there's still someone else's work. And, you know, just those conversations, I think, have been coming up a lot um, in some constructive ways and some critical ways, especially as we, we start to yell about quilting clothing and, you know, what that, what, what that trickle down has become, I think is positive in the sense that having to choose your side, you then understand quilts better. You understand your work better. You understand other people's work better. And I'm, I don't think that it's bad to dislike a technique. I think it's fine for someone to disagree with me. Oh, don't ever cut up an old quilt that has a place in the world. Amazing, that's beautiful. Uh, go collect quilts, right? If you think that quilts should not be cut, collect them, support them, save them, look at pictures of them, all of that, that's brilliant. I don't mind cutting them. Um, 
I think that it gives you this on this this ability to have a dialogue with an existing maker. And I think that's really my point and kind of where a lot I see a lot of work that I make that's just so dynamic is the intimate conversation between the components of the work. And we'll certainly see more about that. Um, here's just two more of that same series where I've made a quilt and combined it with an old quilt. Um, I'll go through a couple small projects here. We'll get to I real soon because I'm really excited. Uh, some small bits of old quilts cut together, sewn back to cut apart, sewn back together. Here's the back of it. Um, and I just think they're really beautiful, but they're they're my conversations with old quilts. So the 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 ask to the the ethos, the world, um, the the is 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 it my art now have i made it i bought a quilt and i cut it up and i put it back together you know is that me imposing those small choices enough for it to be different for it to be new for it to be interesting i think so i think they're really fun i mean you can see in parts of this like this quilt was too ragged to use certainly no museum wants to collect it because there's so many examples of perfectly uh, preserved quilts that they don't really have space to just house falling apart ones. So I felt a good permission to use it. And so I've created these pieces from, from these quilts um, as, a, as a conversation with um, the, the makers, the object of the quilt, the deterioration of the material, the fabric, the, the method of putting it together, both mine and the, the original maker. Um, some of them are faded, some of them are, you know, just all of these, these stories implicit in the work, I think are really wonderful bits of conversation that we can then turn into a different dialogue or, you know, novel or whatever the metaphor <laughs> lends itself to. But um, yeah. They are gorgeous, Luke. I'm loving thanks. those small ones. I'm like, yeah, thanks. Oh, that was a, 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 fun, a, a fun experiment. Um, there's still a couple in the shop, which is fun. I'm trying to get them out into the world, which I'm I'm really enjoying. I've, I've not really made small things before, so it's fun. And what's fun about this is making small things has given me the permission to try something I've never tried before, and that's using other people's work as the language. Because we we come into quilting and we're like, oh gosh, we have to do everything ourselves. You know, I you shoot, man. I remember long arms used to be, oh, you can't use a long arm. You have to, you, you know, I mean, hand stitch, you can't make a quilt that's not hand stitched. And um, you know, I'd hired someone to help me long arm some pieces and just got rode out of town on a rail because I didn't do all the work myself. But like I bought the fabric. I didn't dye the fabric. I didn't smelt the needle that my sewing machine uses. So like, where's our line? Where's our line, people? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, I've just got uh, just a, a few more and then we'll get to I. This is made out of kimono sleeves. So I just took the lining of kimono sleeves. Um, I deconstructed some kimonos I bought secondhand in Japan, took the lining of the sleeves, sewed them into strips, and then quilted it. So the conversation is now between me and the oh, I love that maker and the artifacts on that fabric from existing some for a very long time, some for not that long, um, and the colors matching the kimono, which are not there. It's sort of implicit by the colors of those detailing, but it's not actually there. So it's a reference to what it was, but then it becomes its own thing. And sort of again, like who owns it? What's the what's that conversation there? Uh, one more small piece, and this is, uh, I'll, I'll be done here. This is a, a quilt I made uh, where I had a friend sit for a portrait, and then she left me the clothing she was wearing, and then I made a, a, a quilt of her out of her own clothing. So, you know, the conversation there is her clothing became the story that was used to talk about her sort of self and physicality. And, you know, again, that material conversation, and we'll get into that a lot more in Eyes Work, uh, is is I think very dynamic and interesting. And you know, what's, who's the owner and where is that? And what's the value and what's the cost? And you know, there, there's a lot of these pieces that have been addressed at nauseum in the, the, the capital A art world that we just pretend don't happen in the, the small C craft world. And, and I think that they are beautiful conversations that can lend themselves to really interesting work. And then, um, oh, stop share. But, uh, 
again, just to, just to throw out just the, those ideas of the conversation of using existing narrative within your work. Like you don't, you don't, you don't have to, you know, there's a, there's a great Carl Sagan saying, and I've said it on softball before, you know, if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, you have to start by making the universe. <laughs> right. And it's like, yeah, that, I mean, that's true. Like you can't make anything from scratch. So where are our permissions? And I think that it, it there's, there is nothing wrong except for not being intentional, right? I love people who dye their own fabric because there's some intentionality. Um, but uh, I also think that buying fabric's great. Finding fabric is great. Using someone else's quilt who has already bought, found, quilted, bound, bought, cut, sold, whatever quilt, that's great too. Just figure out where your lines are and, you know, have a great time, have a great time. <laughs> That's then that's me for today, y'all. <laughs> um, well, Luke, you certainly left us with plenty to think about. Lots of essential questions, yeah. which I really appreciate. And I think that, especially in, in, the, in the last couple of years, I've really have grown to have an appreciation for the idea of an idea being viral for all the for everything that's in the air right now. But the I've experienced myself that like when an idea that I see in someone else's work takes lodge in my own mind and in my own practice, I hope that it becomes a new thing as I work with it. Like if I catch the flu, it's no longer the flu of the person who gave it to me. It's my flu. I own it now. And so what do I do with it? You know? And so I, I don't even, I don't wrestle. If I, if I see someone's work that's inspiring and like, you know, Heidi, you and Amanda have done some things that I've been exploring in the last few months. And I try to be really good about saying, oh, I saw this piece and inspired me. And now I'm, I'm working with it. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just how, how ideas work. They're conversations. As I'm sitting and exploring these stitches, I think of my friends that inspired them. Same. I've been making all these semi-transparent white quilts. And I, I try to reference that there was one that I really loved that you made. I mean, one of the one of the one of the things that I sit around and think about um, as it relates to this is the cultural narrative that we've come into as far as ownership of idea. There's certainly been cultural narratives in other points in history when ownership of idea is not as important because maybe they're not trying to sell it, right? It, oh, someone is screen sharing something. <laughs> we will put a stop um, to that. Um, but so, so if we didn't have to feed ourselves and pay exorbitant rent and, you know, capitalism, capitalism, maybe we could all just sit around and think about what's the most interesting way to make quilts. And then, the, then it doesn't matter who owns the idea because our only goal is to make 50 generations from now be the best versions of themselves. But there's this sort of, you're tied into, I need to be proprietary because I have to sell it and, or I have to feel legacy, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation. That's a whole nother ball of flex, uh, a conversation, but, but I think it's there. I think it's, it's, you know, if we can all come together and share ideas, we're a, a better version of a collective self. And that's, and that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> amen, amen, amen. I, I would, I, I will, I will don my hat and like, let you go. Okay, let me share my screen. And just so everybody knows, I is also in Brooklyn. So when I get back to New York, we're hanging out. So expect to see pictures real soon of the two of us. Right, I? Yes, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Are you seeing my screens? Yeah, it looks great. Hi, Kishima. Okay, great. <sighs> okay. Uh, thank you everyone here for watching and listening, allowing me to share my story with you today. I was born and raised in Tokyo, Japan. Ever since I was very young, I have always loved sewing. My mother was not into sewing, but I learned knitting and hand sewing skills from my grandmother. When I was a kid, I rode my bicycle to the fabric shops in my neighborhood and spent many hours there looking at fabric. I was fortunate. Uh, that there were so many wonderful fabric stores with great selections of textiles, not only from Japan, but also from US, Asia, and Europe. I have been obsessed with textiles since I was very small. By the time I was a teenager, 
I was making my own clothing and knitting sweaters for myself. In my senior year of high school, I became a foreign exchange student. Oops, sorry. <laughs> foreign stu exchange student in a small town in Wisconsin. While there, my art teacher encouraged me to apply to art schools in the US, which I did. And I studied at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and the School of Visual Arts in New York City. In my early college life as a painting student, I worked in two different styles, brightly colored abstract expressionism and the style of Gustav Klimt with his beautiful female figure amid decorative patterns. These early visual engagements remain vital for me. I made my first quilt of my own design when I was 24 with Japanese crepe fabric called chirimem. I hand pieced and hand quilted it with gold metallic thread and I edit decorative stitches with embroidery floss. From the very beginning, my intention has always been to make artwork to display on the wall and not as a functional bedspread. I've made hundreds of quilted pieces and have never made a single piece to cover my bed yet. In my 20s, I started to collect all the kimonos I found at flea markets held in the shrines and temples in Tokyo. My intense interest in beautiful kimonos grew very strong, and my desire to make my own textiles started to grow along with it. After that, I set my mind to concentrate on textiles. My fascination with textiles quickly evolved and led me to create my own fabric. I taught myself plant-based dyes, spinning yarn, and hand weaving. After a few years of experimenting in weaving and plant-based dyes, I shifted my focus to quilt making because weaving felt too restricted to me. Since I prefer to work intuitively without a plan ahead, I found patchwork was better for me. In this quilt, the gate, I used my indigo dyed fabrics and old kimonos. I edit decorative stitches with indigo dyed sashiko threads. This piece was mainly made from block printed fabrics and silks from India, along with Japanese kimono and regular cotton. This cross like bar design clearly came from my weaving experience. This piece was machine pieced and hand quilted. This piece title Echo was constructed with my weaving fragments of fleece, leather, feather, and Indian tassa silk and raw edge fabrics. And I edit random stitches with threads and strips of fabrics. This work was my attempt to create a an unique and complex visual in an expressive painterly way. In 2003, I started my graduate study in the Fiber and Material Studies Department at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Many of the materials I use in my artwork are considered vintage. I value their historical importance. I love antiques and vintage finds. The neighborhood in Tokyo where I grew up is well known as one of the city's best antique districts. There were many antique, vintage, and secondhand stores specializing in Japanese, Asian, European, African, and American collectibles. I would regularly stop by these stores after school and spend hours happily exploring and looking, just as I did at the fabric stores. Soon after I moved to Chicago, I began obsessively collecting vintage clothing and household materials, including kids' bedsheets, sleeping bags, and pillowcases with cartoon characters printed on them. 
I knew the value from my previous experience antiquing in Tokyo. I loved the bold eye-popping imagery of the characters, pop icons, and patterns. In my mind, they hold a special historical importance within our throwaway society. I want to rescue them before this, they disappear. To me, they are cultural artifacts of our time that are worth saving. Now I'm going to show my pop series. These are all fused and machine quilted. I'm very fond of pop imagery because it is democratic, familiar, and accessible to most everyone, regardless of age, nationality, or class. Similarly, mass-produced printed fabric fits my intention for this work of work. At the heart of my art making is the intention to create a non-hierarchical vision that respects and celebrates each individual. I'm not very interested in using a particular cartoon character to make personal or political statements. Instead, my interest is in making an overall striking, eclectic, and unique visual through the complex layering of motif or motifs of world color and shape. Here are some details. This is one of the largest pieces I have ever made. The life-sized main figure, Snow White, is at the center with a crowned cheetah. In this classic centered composition, some viewers might more easily find a narrative in contrast to my other works that take a more nonlinear path. This is the back side of the piece. I always use black fabric on the back of my quilt so that the viewers can enjoy beautiful quilting lines that look like a drawing. And here is a close up showing the quilting lines in greater detail. I made this another very large scale piece. The title is Burning Up. Here are some details. The processing of the loss of a loved one is another important aspect of my art making. I use it to feel grief, heal, and remember. When I was 13, my mother died as a result of pancreatic cancer at age 44. This enormous loss had a huge impact on me. I believe there is a connection between this experience and my strong attraction to worn out secondhand materials. These materials satisfy personal and universal yearnings on several levels. In them, I can see and feel love, memory, and nostalgia. These cute bed sheets for kids, sleeping bags, and pillowcases were once lovingly selected and used by mothers for their children. Once upon a time, they were used tenderly, later to be discarded. My handling of this type of material, the cutting apart, arranging, and intense quilting to unify the parts into one piece of tapestry, sorry, <laughs> is a healing process. I experience a deep feeling of empathy and the presence of a mother's love for her child, something I've longed for. In Japan, I was taught that all things have a soul to respect and care for. They should be reused and cherished instead of casually thrown away. Two Japanese folk textile tradition which exemplify this idea are boro and sakiori. This philosophy in the culture and collective unconscious of Japan has proved to be a guiding force within me. It has led me to use mostly secondhand materials, bed sheets, pillowcases, tablecloths, scarves, tea towels, 
handkerchiefs, aprons, kimonos, movie banners, clothing, and more find their way into my art. In 2006, I moved from Chicago to New York City. For me, the process of collage making is a mental discipline to stay in the flow state. I challenge myself to find the perfect place, always seeking the right spot for an image or pattern, freed from hesitation, personal bias, and doubt. My intention is to present a non-objective, eclectic, yet balanced vision in which all the imagery in the work is presented equally. My goal is that intricate multitudes of unique and disparate parts coexist and flow into an expressive fluid motion. I'm not hesitant about juxtaposing elements from distinctly different times and places to create a visually striking piece of art. In 2013, I and my late partner, the art photographer Brian McKee, spent three months in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. I created a new body of artwork entitled New Love Plan. This series focuses on the Japanese manga culture. I only used materials from Japan. During my childhood, Japanese manga and anime, American animation and pop culture were ever present and played an important visual role in the world we knew. My three older brothers and my childhood girlfriends are, and I all loved manga and animation on TV. We had plenty of manga to read and continuously exchange with each other. Having the three older brothers, I read not only massive amounts of comics for intended for girls, but also comics for boys and young adult men, which were available in our home. These often contained a lot of violent and sexual content. From this experience absorbing both girls and boys comics, I gained somewhat gender fluid gaze. Our family activities often tended to be for the boys. At the time, conventional boy activities like fishing, camping, playing soccer, video games, watching baseball, and so on. I think I absorbed insight and some understanding of how boys perceive the world around them. This could explain why I'm not hesitant to place superheroes and Disney princesses within the same field in my work. As a child, I did love the conventional activities that girls enjoy, including dressing up dolls and sewing. In some ways, I'm trying to address and celebrate the differences, stereotypes, and in-between states, status, of gender fluidity in my work as well. I work very intuitively. In this way, my work is about self-discovery and transformation. From 2013 to 18, I lived in Istanbul, Turkey. In 2013, Brian was given the opportunity to work on a project in Turkey. The project allowed us to live and travel extensively throughout the country. We traveled from the Western Sea to the Far East, which border Iran and Armenia. During these travels, I was able to see and research the diverse cultural traditions that range from region to region. This is an image that women are washing wool before the heavy storm in Van. These are images of men repairing carpets in Sultan Han in central Anatolia. When I came to Istanbul, I had decided not to bring any fabric with me from my collection in New York. Instead, I brought only my sewing machine and selection of threads. 
and my cat Tamago. I didn't know ahead of time exactly what I was going to make while there, but I wanted it instead to be an organic process that I grew as I grew. I wanted it emerge as I became more aware and learned from my new surroundings. Fortunately, I found that in Istanbul, there are flea markets that pop up on the weekends. Here, I collected a large amount of material, including scarves, clothing, bags, carpets, and more. These are some of the things I found there. Embroideries, trims, beads, buttons, and notions. This is a view of my studio in Istanbul. This work project was made from mainly handmade materials, such as embroideries and kilims. They are more intimate, sorry. <laughs> they are more intimate, private images that a single person put their thought and their soul into creating. The work is meant to gather voices of women who have found their personal expression in textiles. I embellished with sequins, piece, rhinestones, and trims. More details. The culture of scarves is very much a part of society in Turkey. I collected most of my materials from the flea markets. I like the fact that the item has a history behind it, that it was used, and that someone obviously selected it for a very specific reason, color, pattern, personal meaning, etc. Seeing so many women dressed with colorful and beautiful scarves on the street, I would say that it influenced me to start and see my work and the possibilities of collage in a way I had never explored before. I started experimenting with scarves, which is not really good for quilt making because it's so slippery. This work was, has nothing directly to do with and is not meant as a comment on the religious practice of wearing scarves. This piece is titled Ingress Number One. It was done with hand applique. After the flea markets, I rarely found anything with cartoon characters on it. Figures in my work were now replaced by shapes, patterns, and colors. My work has continued to grow increasingly abstract and geometrical, influenced by Islamic art and architecture. This piece is titled Ingress number two, stretched on canvas stretchers. In addition, I received an extraordinary stash of old Turkish and Central Asian fabric remnants from my dear friend Osman, the owner of a beautiful shop specializing in antique textiles in Istanbul's Grand Bazaar. Working with these lovely scraps, I made a patchwork piece one of my most traditional design pieces, I used paper foundation to get perfect, accurate blocks. I was in love with these fabrics and felt moved to pay homage to their cultures and histories. I stayed with the traditional patterns in these regions and added my own signature improvisational style to arrange the composition. Here are some details. This is an installation view of my solo exhibition, Beyond Beyond, at Arizona State University Art Museum in 2018. These are works I created in Istanbul. Another view. After returning to Brooklyn in 2018, I was commissioned to create Japanese borrow panels using old indigo folk textiles such as kasuri and katazome. In the process of working on the project, 
I discovered similarities between the older traditional textile technique and the construction method that I use with my pop quilts. I hadn't previously been conscious of this. Oro is repurposed indigo textiles constructed of patches pieced together and reinforced with running stitches. In my pop work, I must think quilt meticulously all over the fused and layered images on the quilt. This showed me how fundamental my native Eastern philosophy is to who I am today, even more than I could have ever imagined. This is the installation testing at my studio. And this is the final installation view at Hiro, a Japanese restaurant in Venetian Macau. China. Another installation view. My process ha has always been pretty much the same. I never make a drawing or a plan before I start a piece. I use materials I find in my surroundings and try to work in a very organic and intuitive way and then let the artwork evolve itself. I'm aware that I, as I age and continue to grow spiritually, I'm succeeding in detaching particular and literal meanings from each image. I've started to see them more and more as fragments of abstract color, form, and mass. I'm very curious to see how far I can push toward abstraction while using the same materials and technique. This is a picture of my friend Osman. He is the fabric dealer that I talked about earlier, the one I met in Istanbul during my residency there. During COVID, he sent me a wonderful care package of these fabric remnants and scraps from Central Asia. I wondered to myself, what can I do with this? At the same time, I had been learning about and collecting textiles from India ever since I traveled there for the first time in the fall of 2019, right before the pandemic started. Visiting the workshops where women make beautiful textiles on traditional looms. Since then, it's been my dream to go back there and continue exploring and learning more about their culture and their arts. So I had these vintage silk saris and hand block printed cotton, but I was not really sure how I was going to use all these beautiful fabrics. I'd just been looking at them in my studio and thinking about what would be the best way to present and celebrate the inherent beauty while still somehow creating something new but making sure to show my deep respect for their ethnic heritage by preserving it within the work. At the very end of 2021, I started to make octagon shaped hand applique pieces with the fabrics from India and I really liked them, but not really knowing what to do with them. I started to research Indian architecture and the symbolisms of the octagon, studying, for example, the plans of Mughal mausoleums, such as the famous Taj Mahal that the Emperor Shah Jahan built in the 17th century in memory of his wife. The Mughal emperors believed that in the beauty of symmetry to represent order precision and perfection, which didn't really interest me, but I was highly inspired by its use of octagon, narrow strips, squares, and rectangles, and richly decorated geometric and floral elements. So these monumental mausoleums that emperors created to celebrate their lives of their loved ones gave me the idea for a new series. I made a plan to create eight large scale size works using these formal motifs of, of octagons and connecting strips. This is the first one. 
This is the second one, made from those hand block printed cotton from India I showed before, known as Ajarak. These textiles are named for the word meaning blue in Arabic and Persian, and they have the universe or the night sky as its theme. The blue in the design is for the sky, the red for twilight, and the night is the black. The moments of white motifs throughout the fabric are like stars on the dark night. Here's a picture showing an octagon piece from the Central Asian fabrics, mainly from Uzbekistan. The ones my friend Osman sent me. Here's another piece from this series. This one is made from Japanese indigo kimonos. Living for four and a half years in Istanbul, Turkey made me realize what a crossroad it is for so many countries surrounding it. I had access to amazing traditional fabrics from places such as Central Asia, India, and the Middle East. So when I was living and traveling throughout Turkey, I had the idea to make a project to deal with the idea of the Silk Road someday. The Silk Road was, and still is, an ancient network of roads that stretch from China to Korea and Japan in the East, and also connects to China and through Central Asia to India in the South and Turkey and East in the West. This octagon series then is also a kind of Silk Road too. One way to think about this series and my work in general is that I'm traveling around the world, learning each of these very different visual languages. Doing this lets me become comfortable enough to even try combining them in a single piece, like in this one, which has Japanese, Uzbek, and Indian fabrics. And one of the things I love about having these strong and unifying visual motifs is that it allows me to put all of my different styles, all of these different cultures into a single series. I can even make a pop octagon piece like the one on the wall here or use those sumi ink pieces on the table in front of it to make one too. Here's an octagon piece with those sumi ink painted interfacing plus some traditional Japanese, Indian, and Central Asian fabrics. My partner, Brian, who I mentioned earlier, passed away in April of 2018. He was a fine art photographer and did a project about Islamic architecture in countries such as India, Uzbekistan, Turkey, and Afghanistan. He often talked about his trips to those countries. And we dreamed about visiting there together. Sorry. I still remember so vividly when you shared on Instagram about losing him. I just, my heart was broken for you when you shared that. Thank you for being brave to, to talk about it and share about it with us today. We dreamed about visiting there together someday. So this city is also a tribute to him. That's the end of my story. Thank you everyone for watching. Oh. Ah, your work is incredible. And I just feel so honored that you took so much time to prepare your presentation and write everything and time yourself to be, um, oh my goodness, just absolutely incredible. I'm sure you weren't able to read while sharing, but the comments in the chat are just, um, people love your work and are really blown away. <laughs> Sorry. I've got so many questions and so much 
inspiration and I don't know where to start. I mean, since we have an audience, I bet I should start with the questions rather than staring off in the space and thinking about it. But, uh, <laughs> um, first of all, thank you for sharing all of that. There's a lot there that it's wonderful to hear more stories about because I can look at your images and we haven't got an opportunity to meet yet. So I don't know all of the, the history and the story and your experience. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and it, it, it explains how, and you first look at some of the work, um, it looks different, right? The pop art pieces versus some of the more um, traditional uh, uh, fabrics from different parts uh, kind of look like different stories, but it's the same story. It is a conversation of the intrinsic qualities of a culture in what it produces, right? I mean, like it makes a lot of sense that sort of the United States and, and Japan would have kind of pop art imagery on their fabric, but then some of these kind of Middle Eastern cultures or sort of especially like Northern Japan would have these very traditional weavings. And, you know, so there's the same, <clears throat> the same conversation about the story implicit in the work in both the more traditional fabric as well as the, the pop art. So I love to see how those are coming back together in your work and how you talk about that, how you, how you stopped doing those pop art pieces when you traveled but then you realize that it's the same process. It's just different information on the, the fabric. I think that was so, um, I, you know, I learned, I learned a lot. <laughs> so thank you for that. Maybe it wasn't a question as much as saying thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I didn't know that history about your mother and that as such a point of origin in thinking about a mother's love and the care that goes into being tucked in at bed. And um, it, it just adds such a very interesting additional dimension to the work. Um, are there, yes, yeah, so, so there's a lot of healing that's happening in the work as well. I wonder if if it would feel good to expand on that like heal, healing quality of making quilts. So, so I guess my question is, um, it, if you could expand on, on how it's been healing and helpful to be a quilter in connection to grief or life changes. For me, like quilt making or art making is, that's what I do, you know. Mm -hmm. And it just uh, automatically just helps me to grow as a person mm -hmm. and just keep moving. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful to see in the work too. I mean, just your, your conversations with your life experience. I have a, I do have a technical question, which sometimes is annoying if you just shove it in the middle, but you're fusing things down. You've got these beautiful big pictures from the, you know, the, the sort of pop art um, fabric and, you know, sheets and, and, and pillowcases and stuff. What fusible do you use? <laughs> under, under. Okay. Under, under. Now we all know. Magic. I, oh, oh, look, I, look, I'm just going to talk all day. Y'all can just jump in if you want, because I've got so much to say. The back of your quilt blew my mind. The front of your quilts are amazing. I love looking. I just, I'm, I'm so excited to keep looking and learning and, and watching more. But the back, I hadn't seen that. And that was just, <laughs> there's, um, it's like a, a secret in some ways. It's almost like, because the, the imagery on the front is so vibrant. When you flip it over, you see how much love and time and effort and intention that you have put into making the piece, right? You didn't just glue it together. You just like, you touched every single part of it with color and stitching and fabric. And just like the way you put it together, you flip it over. And I know so much more about you and I know so much about the art and the, just from the back of it. I've just, you know, that was such a, a dynamic moment. So thank you for sharing that as well. And I, I was struck by a lot of things, but the one thing I'd like to hear a little more of, and maybe we can just do this one-on-one -on -one when we get together and hang out, but uh, <laughs> you mentioned that when you work, you think about the flow state, right? And trying to get into the flow of making something that's visually and aesthetically pleasing. And I feel like we hear 
a lot of people talk about making as a meditative process, but I feel like there's something in there for you that is even more mm, intentional, maybe like that, that you approach a particular project as a channel for meditation and flow that you approach the process of making a particular piece as a way of reaching a certain state of being. Would you say that's accurate? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, so you do view part of your process as a meditative experience? Yeah, I try not to, you know, think too much. But of course I think, uh, I, you know, so I kind of try to put images that I don't like, or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I just go against, sometimes I go against with my, you know, my ego or mm -hmm. <laughs> just to, well, and that was another thing that really stood out to me was that you don't necessarily pick individual images for their narrative quality or for the story they tell, that what is more important to you many times is the fact that it was once an object that somebody chose. What's more important to you is the fact that that object was at one time well-loved, we like to think, by somebody, and that you're rescuing it. Right? It doesn't matter if Scooby-Doo is on the fabric. What matters to you is that it was once really loved. Mm -hmm. there's, there's so much to it. It's so interesting because it doesn't matter that it's Scooby-Doo, but you're cutting out Scooby-Doo. So you're, <laughs> you're, you're, like, you're like almost uh, finding a dictionary of a language you don't know and making sentences, right? I mean, so you're, you're using the words of the fabric, the images, but you're not creating the story of it. You are turning it backwards. So it's kind of like hearing somebody speak in a language they don't know, and then finding that words beautiful, right? I mean, because you aren't creating a story, you're not saying Scooby-Doo and Polly Pocket went to the store and they bought a big boy hamburger. You're saying um, this is a slice through the experience of, of fabric of, of and like and not just fabric it's a slice to the experience of people seeing the fabric and and, and and engaging with it which I think is just so dynamic thank you um I I have kind of a, a business side question because you've been in so many galleries and museums and 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 do so much that's international what are some of your priorities when you choose an exhibition or a gallery or a show or if you could talk a little bit just about you know how you've arrived at this very financially stable place in your you know or if <laughs> but um you know how how do you make choices around that business side of your artwork with exhibits, pricing, galleries, etc. That's a big <laughs> question, but um, it's all about commitment. I mean, I I'm an artist, period, and then and then just the things to follow. <laughs> yeah, you just have to have a commitment. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. I love that. What it, you're saying, you're saying I have to, and I just do the things that are required to make it work. I think that's yeah. such a, a clean way to say that. Mm. How do you balance some of your time? Do you, do you spend most of your time sewing or you spend a lot of time on that business side of, of, of applying to exhibit or working with with other spaces, answering emails. My priority is studio. Yeah. 
like first things, you know, wake, I, I wake up early, but I, like be, between 6.30 to 7.30, I go to my studio mm -hmm. and work uh, like, you know, throughout in the morning time. And I have lunch and, and I go back to my studio again. Mm -hmm. So like emails and other business things that this priority, right? Yeah, yeah, it happens on the side. You spend like your your nine to five, your main work day is sewing. Just nine to five, even sometimes yeah, more. more. Like 10 hours, you know, studio time without emailing or like some things like that. And I work like almost seven days a week sometimes. I don't need really, it because this is my passion. Mm -hmm. so this is, I don't really have a hobby or any, like other things. So I just make art. Yeah, that's incredibly inspiring. I wonder, so we've got some questions in the chat. And I, and I see there's there's a lot we won't have time to get to them because I know with not on the time there's a couple of mothers we know they're out there waiting for me and I. <laughs> but I'm I'm really curious and this might be a good way to kind of segue to wrapping up. Um, Chrissy Vanderworker's question well, that just disappeared from my screen. Chrissy's question was I what what is your relationship to your pieces after you make them like where all these quilts you just showed us where are they right now are they hanging on your wall are they in a box. Are they in a gallery? Where does your work go after you make it? With some of, some of them just in the, in the storage in my studio, just rolled up everything. And some, some of them go to galleries and some goes to like collector's house. And as you said, you've never ever made one for a bed. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what do you have on your bed? Oh, just a blanket. <laughs> you <laughs> <are> blanket. <laughs> um, we have we have a question from Carly Knight, who's a, a a fiber artist here in Milwaukee, and she's asking, "What do you listen to while you work? Is it silent or music, podcast, TV?" It changes every. Yeah. It changed like music, podcast. Not silent. I I always use some music or some talk. What were you listening to like earlier today or yesterday? Uh, I've been so busy preparing this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just so, so nervous and just practicing. You've just been watching softball episodes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Thank you for all of that, uh, all the time and effort and story that you you presented. It was so wonderful to hear. Um, I do. I wrote. I mean, I wrote some notes, but one thing I do want to. I just want to say again, just for myself um, and maybe for other folks, but just the thing that you said early. You said pop imagery is democratic, and I, you know, I almost had to. If I could have paused it and walked away, I would have because I have to think about that for a very long time. I think that's such a smart way to think about the, the things that we see and interact with. Pop imagery is democratic. Like democratic is, is exactly the right word for, for it. And I'm just, um, you know, again, along with other things that, that just stood out. So thank you for that. Thank you for those words. Um, I'm gonna think about that for a while. I, we have a question from Chrissy asking what kind of sewing machine you use. Um, you showed before in your suitcase, you brought a small sewing machine. Do you also use a long arm? Never. Never. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever tried one out? Like, are you curious? No. <laughs> so what brand, like what's your, what's your sewing machine? The one I brought to Turkey was like an old vintage Barunina. Mm. And um, Carly also asked, approximately how long does it take to make a piece? Or do you keep track of the time? Yes, I, my sizes are very different. So. It sounds like they're very labor intensive though. And just from looking at the back, like it's, 
hundreds of hours going into things. Sure. Is there anything else that you would like to share, especially about how folks can keep up with you? So um, you have an exhibition coming up that you could share. I know you have your website and your Instagram that we've shared, but how can people know more about you and your work if they're curious? Well, I think Instagram is the best way to see my updates because I post quite often. So. Oh, it's been <laughs> just pure joy getting to talk to you. Thank you very, very, very much. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. All right. Heidi and Luke, what do we, what do we say now? Because, you know, yeah. in some ways it's the end of an era. In some ways it's just another softball because we're not really going anywhere. Mm -hmm. So what do we say? It will be a new schedule three yeah. to four times a year. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm kicking off and doing more Instagram lives lately. So tomorrow, or not Instagram live, YouTube live. Tomorrow I'll have Maggie Muth on to talk about her narrative embroidery. And next week, my friend Elena Parnell is going to be on to talk about her photography. She photographs pages of her actual paper diary, and that is part of her art. Uh, Next month, I'll be talking with my creative habits team, Tara Fonin, Carolyn Friedlander, and Libs Elliott. So we'll we'll be on sharing next month. So there are a lot of ways to continue to stay in touch with me on YouTube. Um, Carly just shared that she watched the talk that I did with Ariana Veith recently and enjoyed that. Um, so that's one of the big ways to stay in touch with me is, is I'm going to try to have at least once a month something on YouTube as a conversation. And um, Luke, what have you got that's new that you're keeping up with? I know you have a class coming up and you've got your Patreon. <laughs> well, for me, I'm just trying to create more exciting classes because my goal, kind of like Zach's is, is to create a community of makers that we get to hang out together and you know, make awesome things. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm, my goal for next year, since we're sort of at the end of this one, is I'm going to do a sort of guerrilla gallery type sort of takeover of Los Angeles. I'm going to try to do one show a month in Los Angeles somewhere, sometimes that I ask permission and sometimes that I don't. And uh, <laughs> just see how that goes in terms of getting work into the world, kind of. Um, yeah, like just, you know, the art world has such a, a a system in place. And I think it will be fun to push the edges of that as a craft maker. Which sounds like it'll give us a really good excuse to come back together. Yes. Yeah. And I think if folks want to keep in touch with me, um, Instagram is, is there. I will say, though, that in like recent weeks, I don't know if anybody's noticed, I've kind of stepped back a little bit with Instagram. I'm not doing quite as much as I once was because all my energy is going to the nook these days. Like, it's such a sweet space to be that I'm like, I was talking to my partner about this yesterday that like, I only got so many hours in a day. Where do I really want to like plant my seeds? And it's 100% in the nook. We're having such a good time there. So if, if you want to join us over there, hop on over. We're having a good time. And maybe one Instagram savvy tip for everyone is now is the time of year to go back, look at your 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 most successful posts of the year and repost your favorite photo or the one that got the most likes. It will boost your Instagram in a second. So um, don't don't be shy about resharing. That's something that I also learned back in the day when I was perusing people's websites very deeply. I was also scanning Instagram history. And if you've got a good photo, post it more than once and say it's in the spirit of January and the end of the year, that kind of reminiscing moment. All right, everyone. Thank you very, very much. And thanks, thanks. Bye. Thank you. Happy holidays. Happy New Year.